Hello, and welcome to A Beginner's Guide to Manon. Manon is an opera composed by Jules Massenet, and it is sung in French. This opera is not to be confused with Manon Lescaut, which does follow the same story, but was composed by Giacomo Puccini and is sung in Italian. So while the story remains the same, the styles are very different. This Manon is sung in a style that can truly be called grand opera. It takes place over the course of five acts. There's a ballet in the middle, and it uses sweeping, lush, romantic music. That is romantic with a capital R, belonging to the romantic period of composition that fell generally within the 19th century. There is some spoken dialogue in Manon with, which breaks with tradition, but there is also some true recitative or sung dialogue as well. There is less strict melody in these recitatives than some other operas, but it has far more emotional conveyance because of that. Manon has proved to be far too much for her rural family to handle, as she is high-spirited, ambitious, flirtatious, and mischievous. They are sending her off to a convent with the understanding that her cousin Lescaut will meet her off the stagecoach. We never do find out Lescaut's first name within this opera. However, while she is left alone on the platform, Manon meets the young poet Desgrieux. Together they run away to Paris, but her desire for a life with Desgrieux is always at odds with her desire for the high life, and we see the consequences of that desire play out in the final acts. This opera is based on the novel Manon Lescaut by Abbe Antoine Francois Prévost, which was written in the 1700s. But this opera can be set at any time. My particular favorite production, which was the Met's most recent production, originally staged some years before, but revived in the fall of 2019, which is set during La Belle Époque or the early 1900s, but that's just my personal preference. The story looks at age-old questions, namely love versus money, but it also looks at the question, can a woman be a wife and also a society girl or a working woman? However, we feel about those questions today Based on the era in which the opera was written, we know that it cannot go well for Menel. She cannot be allowed to have both her desires. In most operas written in the 19th century, as Menel was, a woman's desire for freedom or economic independence, any sort of deviation from the norm, must be punished. We see this with Manon, we see it with Carmen, we even see it to some extent in La Boheme. This conflict does, however, help us to examine our own feelings on the topic today, which is, after all, what all great art should do. There are many special and beautiful musical moments in Manon, but I have chosen five for us to look at today. The first is Manon's first aria. She speaks a couple of sentences to her cousin Lescaut and then breaks off into the aria, Je suis encore tout étourdi, or I am still totally discombobulated. She has just arrived off the coach from Arras and tells the story of her journey to her cousin Lescaut. I have enclosed a video below which shows Nathalie Dessay the wonderful French soprano, singing this aria in a production from 2012. As a side note, I have no idea what the costume designer's choices were, but Nathalie Dessay is a wonderful singer. 
Since this video is not subtitled, there is also a link to the lyrics down below for you to read along. The most notable feature to me about this aria is its incredibly expressive composition. And this holds true throughout the opera. You can even hear it in the rise and fall of the notes on the word etourdi, which I will sing an octave lower as I am not a soprano. Je suis encore tout étourdi. That rise and fall onto a minor chord helps us get the feeling of being dizzy, being confused, being having your head all in a rush. In addition, this aria is full of accidentals, as though Manon's infectious spirit is trying to break out of the key signature into which Massenet has imprisoned her. And indeed, each new emotion that happens throughout the course of the aria, such as when she mentions going to the convent and when she mentions crying, changes the key again. Her emotions are so infectious that they change the direction of the music. There is also a lot of composition that for lack of a better word, I am calling onomatopoetic musical composition, i.e. in the orchestration you can hear the jingle of the horse's bridles as she describes how the coach starts out, and indeed the fall of notes when she describes crying without knowing why, and her wonderful cadenza that turns into actual laughter when she describes then changing to laughter, still without knowing why. Then after all of these outbursts and key changes, she has a few breathless phrases to get herself back under control. Ah, ma cousin, excusez-moi. And that pardon at the end brings her back into the original key signature and the original melody, as though either she or Lescaut are trying to force her back into her original box and keep her under control. By the time this aria is over, you are in love with Manon, but you can also see why her family sent her away. The next major musical moment for me is in Act Two, when Manon sings Adieu notre petite table, or Farewell our little table. She has just been persuaded by friends of Lescaut's to leave De Grieux because his father is not happy with this arrangement. It doesn't look likely that he would allow them to marry. And besides which, this friend points out, her beauty would be utterly wasted on just one man. Why not share it with Paris society? And Manon goes through a rather agonizing soliloquy before she breaks into this aria of which I only have a clip for you to listen down below, but it is a clip from my favorite production starring Lisette Oropesa in 2019. Her soliloquy beforehand is sung, but it's best to treat it like a recitative, as she is talking to herself and trying to sort out, should I leave him? Yes, I should leave him. I feel horrible for doing it. No, no, he doesn't deserve my love. That's it. I am so unworthy that I will leave him and spare him. But she does indulge in a farewell to the little garret apartment that they share together in this aria. And for all of Manon's materialism, she does spend this aria focused on objects, but they're not the objects that I, as a viewer, would expect her to focus on. She's focusing on a glass, a table, a chair. These are ordinary things. These are not symbols of high status. So to me, although she is focusing on the objects, she is using those as symbols for their relationship because she can't bring herself to talk about her own emotions. This aria fully expresses her pain at the idea of leaving him, and it is fully within a minor key. There are no key changes like before, except for the final note. The final note of adieu 
is an accidental. It should end on a B flat to fall into B flat major. However, it ends on a B natural, which to me serves two purposes. It's as though Manon is trying to end it in a brighter key, as though she's trying to plaster a smile on her face to pretend that everything's all right. But this B natural against an entire aria in F minor, the relative minor of B flat major, I'm sorry, that should be G minor. It's been a while since I had any music theory lessons, but that major note against what has been a constant of, B min of G minor rings false. It doesn't transition us into a brighter key the way Men Menel wants, and we can see straight through her facade. The major question here is, why is she truly leaving him? Is it truly for his benefit? Or is it for hers? And it's up to each actress playing Menel to decide what the answer really is to that question. Directly after this, Degrieux comes back from running an errand, and after a slight conversation, he tells Menon of a dream that he had. And thus begins my third musical moment, En fermant les yeux. Its title loosely translates to Upon Closing My Eyes. Below, I have linked an audio recording of the tenor Jonas Kaufmann singing this aria with a little bit of help from Sonia Yoncheva whenever Manon interjects. And I have also enclosed a link with translated lyrics so you can follow along. There are two truly notable things about this aria. And the first that really grabbed me is the very repetitive orchestration. It's mostly within, G, within D major arpeggios, but those patterns do change every once in a while, almost the same way a guitar's chords would. But it's very simple, very light orchestration in the strings. That's all. As I mentioned as well, it's in D major, which is a very open key. And it mirrors how De Creer is laying his heart open to Manon by telling her of his dream of what has become a stereotypical wish of the beautiful white house in the countryside, surrounded by woods and flowers and everything tranquil and beautiful that he hopes to share with Menel. And the last piece that makes this piece truly beautiful is the tenor's use of dynamics. How soft and delicate he can be while delivering this news, but then also the intense love for Manon, which ramps up the volume in a couple of scenes, especially when he tells her, no, it was not perfect because you weren't in it. It is truly moving and beautiful if the tenor has done his job well. And Jonas Kaufmann always does his job well. Thus, we move into act three, when Menon and Degria have indeed been separated and Menon has become the queen of Paris society. Thus, I will include the next clip down below, which is of two pieces. The first piece of the aria begins with, and I'm going to have to read this to get it absolutely accurate, Je marche sous tous les chemins. Les chemins. Please pardon my French pronunciation. I have attached a video of the wonderful Lisette Oropesa from my favorite production of Manon at the Met, singing both of these halves of her major act three aria. And it then transitions into a second half, which is just usually just called the Gavotte. We open act three at the feast of Cour la Reine, where all of Paris is turned out and having a wonderful time, having shopping sprees and flirtations galore. It is just pleasure unleashed, almost a bacchanal. And after admiring many elegant women who go past, Manon makes her entrance, and these other elegant women are forgotten at once. There is a regal pomp to everything she sings in this aria, she is showing off. She is enjoying her new life to the fullest, and she is fully in control of it. 
such that when she enters, she changes the key and does so much flourishing within all of her sentences, cadenzas and trills and runs, that the orchestra is almost silent, except for little moments of punctuation almost. Manon is truly commanding the stage. Indeed, some of these cadenzas underscore particular words. And the two words that they emphasize within the first half of the aria are queen and beautiful. And this shows exactly what Manon's priorities are at this point in her life. That she is the queen of society, that she is the most beautiful, and this is where she is finding happiness now. In true Massenet fashion, there is more onomatopoetic singing in that the final line is, and if Manon should die, it will be in a fit of laughter. And the cadenza on laughter does truly sound like laughter. However, this time, unlike in her opening aria in Act One, there's a prophetic twinge to it because we know Manon has hit the apex of her achievements and therefore it's all downhill from here. The second half, the gavotte, is a dance or was a popular dance in the 1700s. But this song also has a similar ominous twinge to it. Manon sings of taking advantage of one's youth while one can, which is precisely what she's done. But there's also a bridge in which she sings about how even the most faithful lovers will leave eventually to pursue other pursuits. And this section takes on some minor chords. And so as an audience, we have to wonder, is Manon reflecting on how these lines truly apply to her and what she has done to Degrieux? After this scene, however, she discovers that Degrieux was returned home to his father and he refused to marry anyone else and he is now determined to become a priest. And indeed, he is making quite a name for himself and is on the road to becoming highly placed within the church. And he is currently serving at the chapel of Saint-Sulpice. And as soon as Manon hears this, she is determined that Degrieux will never be able to forget her. And she sets straight out for Saint-Sulpice to try and change his mind. The Saint-Sulpice meeting is long and there are many parts to it. The video attached down below is only a piece of it, so I'll tell you when to start watching it. Manon and Degrieux's meeting in Saint-Sulpice is preceded by Manon sitting by herself and praying as she waits for Degrieux to finish service. And that prayer to me is rather amazing because in it she recognizes to God how unworthy she is, what terrible things she has done to reach this point in her life. But she asks for forgiveness for all of that. If only God will turn Degrieux's heart back towards her and have a little mercy in that. When they do meet, their argument is broad and sweeping and intense. First of all, their argument goes through three different key changes. It begins in A flat major, which is four flats. It then moves into either E flat major or C minor. It's hard to tell, which is three flats. Then finally, it ends in B flat major, which is only two flats. It's as though with each removal of a flat from the key signature, Manon and Degrieux come a little bit closer to reaching a final resolution. And when they meet in B flat major, there is definitely resolution, both musically and emotionally. I also love how Massenet's librettist played linguistically here in that Degrieux's first lines when he sees Manon are toi, vous, which both mean you. However, one is informal and one is formal. It's as though he's fighting with himself to keep his formal front up as a priest rather than give in to his more familiar side as he used to be with Manon. More lines presaging death and dreams come into play which have 
ominous echoes yet again. And now finally, you can start the clip, which is in a concert setting, so there's no staging. It's just Nadine Sierra and Michael Fabiano singing the latter half of this meeting. I have therefore also attached some lyrics so that you can follow along. However, the lyrics for the clip start halfway down the page. They begin at Manon's line, Is it so dead? Ominous, I realize, but use that as a marker. Even though this aria is in a major key, there are lots of minor chords throughout it to signify the emotional turmoil and the baited, tragic nature of this love between these two people. I also love that when Menel repeats the line tout comme autrefois, of all as before, she repeats it up the octave, signifying that her begging and persuading of De Grieux is getting more and more desperate, so her voice is rising in pitch. The staging can really make this scene as in, when Manon has a particularly long run of notes, does she caress him as she does it? But it is truly the music that makes all the drama of this scene. The incredible sweeping dynamics, the siren-like chords, that is what makes this scene truly gripping, as even this concert scenario demonstrates. But don't worry, I haven't spoiled anything because this scene in Saint-Suplice is only the end of Act 3, and there are two more acts to go. And I will leave it up to you to watch or to listen to a recording of Menel to find out for yourselves how this love story ends. As I have said before, my personal favorite recording of Menel was done in the fall of 2019, starring Michael Fabiano and Lisette Oropesa. I was lucky enough to see it live at the Met that fall, and it was beautiful. That same production had been staged earlier, starring Piotr Beshala and Anna Netrebko in the title roles, both of which can be viewed on the Met's on-demand streaming service through their website. However, as you can tell from these clips, there are many more beautiful productions of Manon available to watch and to listen to. Please comment down below with any thoughts that you have, whether you are a first-time listener, a complete newbie, or whether you love Manon as much as I do. And until next time, be safe, be well, and happy listening. Bye everyone.